So good morning. Uh, my name is Jessica Issa. I'm one of the uh, Psychiatry Residency Program's PGY4s uh, and also one of the Chiefs of Education. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you all here for our first Summer Grand Rounds. Uh, this is a summer series that's planned by the Chiefs of Education with trainees in mind, uh, both psychiatry residents and uh, psychology fellows. So I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing our speaker, uh, who will actually uh, do a presentation first. Um, then I'll present a case vignette to help stimulate some discussion. I'll ask him specific questions, but we'll also have plenty of time left over for a general discussion with the audience. So uh, Dr. David Berg is today's Grand Round speaker. He's an organizational psychologist with special interest in group and intergroup relations. He received a BA in psychology and an MA in administrative sciences from Yale University, as well as a PhD in organizational psychology from the University of Michigan. For 15 years, Dr. Berg was a professor at the Yale School of Organization and Management, where he taught courses in organizational behavior, group dynamics, research methods, and organizational diagnosis. He's worked with a wide variety of organizations, including Fortune 500 companies, municipalities, not-for-profit foundations, and public school systems. In this work, he strives to maintain connections between the world of ideas and the world of practice. He is now a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine and a member of the core faculty of the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. In these roles, he helps medical students, residents, chief residents, and fellows develop their understanding of groups, leadership, and organizations. Dr. Berg has kindly offered his expertise and guidance to many trainees in medicine, and we value his perspectives and his critiques. Today, we will hear him speak on dissent and its relationship to the use of power in medicine. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Berg to the podium. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is a quote from uh, an editorial in USA Today on the 12th of January, 2006. In 1968, helicopter pilot Hugh Thompson flew into the thick of what he thought was a fierce battle in South Vietnam and discovered instead that a massacre was going on of women, children, and elderly men at the hands of US soldiers. Horrified, he landed his helicopter between the soldiers and the civilians, ordered his crew to fire on any American who continued shooting, called for backup, and rescued victims, digging through corpses to rescue one child. An instant hero, in fact, he was made a pariah. For years, when he walked into officers' clubs, they emptied out. He got threatening phone messages. Dead animals were left on his porch. When he was called to give closed congressional testimony, a senior lawmaker said that if anyone deserved to be court-martialed, it was him. This is a powerful account of conformity and dissent. Uh, I will return to it later in this hour, half hour, because like many healthcare events, this one involves life and death. But first, let me say that I'm honored to be here with you today. As an organizational psychologist, I am keenly aware that I'm not a physician, and I'm not a clinical psychologist, no organic chemistry, no medical school, no residency, no fellowship or practice, no call. I am and have been for the last two decades other, a resident alien living among you, but not really one of you. So to be asked to speak at Psychiatry Grand Rounds about this extremely important topic is both an honor and a testimony to your collective willingness to learn from someone whose background is different but whose concerns overlap. I came to the medical campus after spending 15 years in the School of Management. When I got here, in spite of all of that experience, the power of the hierarchy in the world of medicine caught me by surprise. Occasionally it still does. I suspect that power and hierarchy are particularly interesting to me because I am no stranger to struggles with authority and to the topic I have chosen to talk about today, conformity and dissent. No doubt rooted in my struggles to both please and rebel against my father, a man who wanted the best for me and thought he knew what that was, my struggles with authority persisted throughout my education well into my adult years. And as one who was a child in the 1950s and who came of age in the late 1960s, here on this campus, questions of conformity and dissent were being raised everywhere. The year 1956 produced The Organization Man uh, by William H. White and the movie The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. Two accounts, one sociological and one fictional, 
of the conformity that was beginning to define American culture at that time. In the late 1950s here at Yale, in the basement of Lindsley Chit, Stanley Milgram conducted his now famous studies on obedience and authority. Within a decade, the Vietnam War and the countercultural reaction to the 50s had made dissent, paradoxically, the in thing. I was a product of both of these decades. So perhaps this explains why I have spent so much time trying to understand both conformity and dissent. So let's begin with conformity. Conformity is behavior in accordance with socially accepted conventions or standards. Conformity to socially accepted norms and roles is what makes modern organizations function and function well. We depend on pilots, carpenters, bank tellers, lawyers, doctors, and even psychologists to conform to the accepted conventions and standards of their jobs and professions. If they did not, if we did not, when we inhabit these roles, there would be chaos. This collective dependency, this reliance on others to conform, is what enables us to accomplish more than we could as a set of ind individuals, independent actors on the human stage. Medical training, graduate education in general, are powerful examples of this very important conformity exercise. Your teachers, residents, attendings, colleagues want you to conform to accepted conventions evidence-based practices for this conformity ensures a standard of care that would otherwise be hit or miss. But conformity can result in people not asking questions about the utility or morality of these same socially accepted standards. Nothing in the definition of conformity says anything about questioning or diverging from accepted conventions and standards. Yet progress is precisely the process of questioning the status quo in science, engineering, philosophy, governance, law, in relationships, especially when these questions are based on observation and experience. When they are, they have the potential to accomplish something extremely difficult, the creation of an organization or social system that has the capacity to improve to learn about its inefficiencies or its shortcomings as they relate to its tasks and goals, its unintended consequences. Without this capacity to improve, social systems must decline. This is entropy. They must give less care. They must treat their employees less humanely, and increasingly, they are prone to making mistakes. Dissent then broadly defined, and I'll define it in a moment, is the antidote to conformity unchecked, just as conformity is the corrective to dissent run amok. It is an explicit or implicit critique of how those in authority have been exercising that authority. So here's the definition. Dissent is the assertion by a lower power group that a higher power group has come to believe that its partial view of the world is complete and universal. Dissenters believe that the isolation of the upper group represents either a threat to the core mission of the organization or a threat to the well-being of the dissenting group. Dissent is not primarily a substantive disagreement about tactics or approaches. It is a protest against the upper group's isolation from the experience of the other groups in its environment groups on which it depends and who in turn depend upon it. Dissent can be the antidote to the natural tendency, natural tendency, for groups to see only one view of the social, political, and economic world around them. It is one of the few corrective mechanisms to a process of what I label as ethnocentric estrangement. The separation that grows between groups as each begins to believe in the universality of its experience. This is a normal process. This is one none of us who belong to groups, and I think that means all of us, escape. This estrangement imperils each group's ability to work together, to create or produce together, and to exist in proximity to each other. Dissent does not imply that the dissenting group is always right or accurate. This remains to be determined. Rather, an intergroup perspective views the occurrence of dissent as a piece of data 
about the state of the relationship between two groups with different authority and different levels of power. It provides an opportunity to test the validity of the beliefs and assumptions of the different groups involved. I'm going to look at three cases. The first, um, to, get us, to give us a feel for dissent and how it relates to conformity and some of the challenges involved. Um, this being the Department of Psychiatry, the first case is about the family. Psychiatry, family? <laughs> Great, thank you. The Olam family has a long-standing practice. When, when you read a talk, what happens is people get lulled into a sense of, uh, that must have been on the text there. So I just want you to know, I just left the text when I made the joke <laughs> about the family. This is a real aside. I once watched uh, um, Irving Goffman give a lecture on the lecture. <laughs> he was a very smart guy. And every time he, you, he would tell you about something that makes a lecture feel extemporaneous, like turning a page or looking at a watch, you'd realize he had done that about five minutes before. Okay. The Olin family <clears throat> has a long-standing practice of sitting down to dinner at 6 p.m. each evening. Ever since the two children and their family were able to sit at the table, the parents felt it was important for the family to convene at the dinner hour to share a meal. Both parents went to considerable lengths to make this possible by arranging their work schedules to allow them to be home, and for one of them to be home in time to prepare the meal. The two children are now teenagers in high school, and being on time for dinner has become a problem. Robert, the firstborn, is a serious student and a responsible young man. He is always on time for dinner, almost, and when he isn't, his explanation elicits empathy from his parents and easy forgiveness. Robert has talked to his parents about the dinner hour rule and challenges and the challenges it poses for him, especially in his senior year in high school. The conversation has sometimes been intense, though respectful, but the outcome is always the same. Robert's parents reiterate their view of the importance of the family dinner, including its role in providing time for the family to remain connected, the conversation ends with talk about continuing this family tradition. Robert vows to continue to do his best to be home on time. His sister Beth, a sophomore, is often late for dinner. It's not unusual for her to be half an hour late or to miss most of dinner altogether. This is very upsetting to her parents, but when they express their displeasure to Beth, the confrontation escalates quickly. She screams that they don't understand the hardship this dinner thing imposes on her, and her relationships with others. In the worst moments of these confrontations, Beth's parents tell her they don't care what other people think or do, or what impact this family commitment has on others. Eating dinner together during the week is for their family, and it is important. When Beth's parents try to discipline her for her tardiness, the tension mounts, and the effect is minimal. Beth continues to come late. This familiar family drama, familiar to me, uh, can be understood in many ways. Many of you with children will recognize the first child, second child explanation for this, these events. This view holds that the first child is more attuned to his or her parents' expectations and aspirations, tethered more closely to parental wishes and values during adolescence, and more likely to be the good child. The second child in this picture is more rebellious, the path having been blazed, testing the limits her older sibling seems willing to accept. An intergroup perspective on Beth's descent adds another layer to our potential understanding of what may be happening in this and so many other families. Beth is certainly expressing her wish to be free from the constraints of the six o'clock family dinner. This particular norm has become a burden to her. She wants out. When her parents refuse, she starts to act out, expressing her dissent by absenting herself from dinner with an apparent willingness to suffer the disciplinary consequences. If we treat Beth as a representative of the adolescent group and accept the fact that this is a familiar family event or that Robert encourages his sister in her descent in their quiet moments together, we seek to understand what message she is sending to the parental group. Is it simply that she wants to abolish the family dinner? Or is she trying to convey that her parents have lost any insight into the realities that adolescents face or any empathy for those realities, preferring the realities of the parental group 
and allowing those realities alone to guide their use of authority in a family that includes both adolescents and parents. This second interpretation acknowledges that both groups are encased in a worldview born of their place in that world. But the power difference between the two groups means that while the children might wish to construct family rules that serve an adolescent view of the world, they do not have the power or authority to do so. The parents have the power, and some might argue the responsibility, to construct family rules that serve their possibly more mature parental worldview. This power, together with their worldview and their inevitable separation from the adolescent perspective, including their own experience of adolescence so many years in the past, provides the impetus for dissent. Now let's take a case a little closer to home. Not exactly home, but closer to home. This is a true story. A third year surgical resident was doing hospital rounds and came to see an 80 year old man suffering from a gangrenous leg, a recent stroke that had rendered him unable to communicate, and severe dementia. The blood flow to his leg was so poor that there was no detectable pulse up to his groin. He was in and out of consciousness. The resident had discussed the patient's situation with his son, the man's surrogate decision maker. The only surgical option was a major intervention that would leave the man bed bound for the rest of his life. The son had decided that his father would not want to live under these physical and mental conditions, so the resident left orders to provide comfort care only for the patient. While rounding with her team, consisting of a junior resident, an intern, and a medical student, the resident described the course of the disease, the discussions with the patient's family, and the course of treatment. In this case, no extraordinary measures would be taken, and the team would work hard to make the patient as comfortable and pain-free as possible. Before the team left the patient's room, the resident removed the oxygen feed from the patient's nose and turns off the vital signs monitor. A few moments later, as the team passed in the hallway to another room, the resident noticed that the oxygen had been replaced. She stepped into the room, assuming there had been a misunderstanding of the physician orders written on the chart, once again removed the oxygen and turned off the monitor in accordance with the family's wishes and her instructions. As she was leaving the patient's room, she saw a nurse slip out. It was then that the doctor realized there had been no misunderstanding. The nurse was disobeying her orders. When she found the nurse later that morning, he had assembled a group of nurses to support his position. <laughs> Yet it was clear to the resident that the nurse was petrified of the looming con uh, confrontation. When the resident observed that the nurse's behavior made clear that he was not in support of the doctor's orders and asked his thoughts, he replied, quote, if you want to kill this patient, that's fine, but I'm not going to help you, unquote. Later, the resident began to reflect on the situation. In the world view of this unit, the nurses were the patient's staunch advocates for any and all measures to promote patient health. The nurse did not understand the new treatment plan for this patient. He had not talked with the family or been included in discussions about the patient's care. And even if he had, there is reason to believe, given the intense norms in the unit, that he would not have agreed with it. He saw the healthcare world differently from his position in it. Similarly, the resident was looking at the patient through the lens of her knowledge of the medical options and her conversation with the patient's legal health care surrogate and her role as a senior medical person on the case. Faced with the legitimate authority of the resident, filled with the professional responsibility of nurses on the unit, and believing that the doctor had set her mind on the wrong course of action that she believed to be right because of her professional group membership, a third-year surgical resident, the nurse felt he had no choice but to enact his dissent. Upon reflection, the resident was glad the nurse had expressed his concerns, even to the point of disobedience. She realized that in a hospital where the doctor's orders are rarely questioned, even when flawed, it was important for her to hear from the nurses. Furthermore, she might not have heard the power and intensity of their views in a conversation involving words alone. The dissent did not change her views of what to do for this patient in this situation, but it did alert her to the fact that the relationship between the three groups, doctors, nurses, and the family, had broken down. Each group had lost an understanding of the other's view of the work at hand and replaced it with the certainty of its own, a reality made real by the resident's failure to include the nurse in her team's discussion of the case in the first place. Now I'd like to return to the case uh, that opened uh, my talk, the, um, 
the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam. Uh, this happened in March of 1968. The Vietnam War was a complicated military and political war. On the 16th of March, Lieutenant William Calley, saying he believed he was carrying out a superior's orders to kill the enemy, presided over and participated in the murder of over 300 civilians in the village of My Lai. This event in itself is a remarkable example of the power of conformity, as we'll see later especially during emergencies or times of intense conflict with other groups. And yet, military performance depends on military discipline, and military discipline involves following orders. As I read before, Chief Warrant Officer, I say that because it's his rank, it'll become important in a moment, a Hugh Thompson was flying a support helicopter on the day of the Milai Massacre. He was not under Lieutenant Calley's direct command, though he was junior to Calley, in the military hierarchy. Upon seeing the massacre unfold on the ground beneath him, Thompson landed his helicopter between the American troops and the Vietnamese civilians and demanded to know what was going on. When no answer justified the killing of women and children, Thompson ordered his men to collect survivors from a ditch in which dozens had been killed and flew them out of the hamlet to safety. Thompson returned a second time to rescue a small child. When his mission was over, he reported what he had seen and done to his superiors. In my opinion, contrary to the reactions of many in and out of the military at the time, this was a heroic stand by Thompson. Arguably, he was representing the group of soldiers, both in his helicopter and in Lieutenant Calley's uh, uh, unit, <clears throat> who vehemently disagreed with the view of the world, admittedly a chaotic and morally unmoored world, enacted by Lieutenant Calley. But I think the more instructive illustration of dissent in this case comes to us from another quarter. Ronald Ridenour was the, in the same locale as Hugh Thompson at the end of 1967 and the beginning of 1968. He was not at My Lai on the day of the massacre, but he was familiar with the village from having flown helicopter reconnaissance in the area. In the weeks following the massacre, Ridenour began hearing stories about the massacre at My Lai from soldiers who had trained with him in Hawaii. At first, he was horrified by what the men who served under Lieutenant Calley at My Lai on the day of the massacre were telling him. He had no doubt they were telling the truth to a fellow draftee, an army grunt. While in Vietnam, he resolved to do what he could to prompt an investigation into the massacre. Before and after he was discharged, he gathered as many facts as he could. Nearly everyone to whom he spoke, military personnel as well as family and friends, told him not to pursue his efforts to bring the massacre to light. The official version of that day had already been written into the Army's account of the war, that 128 Viet Cong had been killed at My Lai with only one American wounded. Ridenauer knew this was a lie. Only one draft-age Vietnamese man had been seen that day, running, albeit with a weapon, away from the village as the helicopters began to arrive. No weapons had been seen or discovered in the village. In the face of official lies and countless first-hand accounts of a massacre at My Lai, Ronald Ridenauer wrote to then-President Nixon and 30 congressmen to request an investigation. Only one, Morris Udall from Arizona, took up the cause, which ultimately led to a full-scale investigation. One of the backstories to Ridenauer's dissent involves the behavior of the Pentagon leadership in the months prior to the My Lai massacre. The war in Vietnam was not going well from the perspective of the military and civilian leadership. In an effort to convince the public that this messy war, in which winning was hard to define, when hilltops were taken one day and then abandoned weeks later, was indeed being handled successfully, the Pentagon began to measure military success by the number of enemy combatants killed. The metric to assess the war became these body counts. Every combat unit was responsible for reporting the number of enemy combatants killed during an operation. And as you can imagine, zero was not a productive RV number. <laughs> it was often impossible to verify the combat status, combat status of a dead body, but the pressure to produce tangible evidence of military success was clear and strong. 
There are a number of implications of the My Lai experience for the discussion of dissent. First, it is clear that individual acts of dissent were not simply individual acts. Thompson's crew, as a group, followed his directive to obstruct the local commanding officer's order to kill the Hamlet civilian. Importantly, their conformity to his orders was critical in rescuing the civilians they were able to save. Hence, we return to the relationship between conformity and dissent. More important, the process of dissent involved Ridenauer, a significant number of other soldiers who had been on the ground during the operation, testifying to what they had seen and heard. In the face of persistent pressure not to bring forward a picture of events at Milai that contradicted the official history, one man alone might not have succeeded. The weight of evidence came from a group of others. This suggests that dissent is an intergroup rather than an interpersonal communication from the military rank and file to the higher ranking command structure. Second, the dissent concerning Mi Lai in the field and later in the form of Ridenauer's personal investigation, together with a letter to Congress, appears to be an outgrowth of long simmering tensions between combat soldiers in Vietnam and the, and the combat soldiers in Vietnam those, and those in the field who represented the command structure in Washington. There is no doubt that political leaders in Washington were frustrated with the way the Vietnam War was unfolding. Defining success in terms of dead bodies was a measure of last resort, especially when it was clear on the ground long before it was acceptable in Washington that the Vietnam War could not be won with any conventional military strategy available to the United States Army. What was known by these lower ranking men fighting the war in the trenches could not be heard by those higher ranking officials in charge of the war in the Pentagon. And when I say could not be heard, I don't mean heard. I mean the forces acting on those people made it impossible for them to, to acknowledge, take in, metabolize the information that was coming from the field. These higher ranking officials included the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States. Finally, despite the impression that dissent was expressed by those outside Lieutenant Calley's unit, Hugh Thompson, Ronald Ridenauer, the testimonials that Ridenauer collected and the testimony that was compelled in Lieutenant Calley's court-martial came from the same men who had carried out the orders to kill civilians. In the language of group and intergroup relations, the conformity and the dissent came from within the unit. Both processes were present in the unit, often in the same individuals, as they struggled both to follow orders and to protest the decision-making that led to those orders. Except for Hugh Thompson, it was only after the massacre that the dissenting voices found expression. So here's my advice from these three cases and some guiding principles as you struggle to express and to manage dissent productively. Number one, be a good dissenter. Not angry, at least not all the time. Not strident, since this makes it harder for anyone to hear, but not silent either. Be a good recipient of dissent, not dismissive, though you will be tempted, not demeaning, and not patronizing. Two, group memberships affect all of us. No one is exempt. If you're human, you're sitting here thinking you're exempt. You're sitting here thinking when you have a position of authority that you really do understand the people who are in other positions. That's why number two is my advice. We, none of us escape these phenomena. We can come to understand what those effects are, these group effects, on ourselves and to a lesser extent on others, and this can help us make choices about how to act in groups and organizations, how to collect and evaluate information, how to make decisions, how to take action, but we endanger all around us if we think we can transcend the groups to which we belong. Three, top groups and organizations are likely to be encased in their views of the world by A, their trust in their own experience, and B, the withholding of negative feedback from groups below them that feel vulnerable to displeasure of those more powerful groups. So the isolation of the people at the top is a function of, I've been there, I've been a resident, I've been a second, yeah, I've been a fellow, I know what that experience is like and by the fact that the people who are in those roles at the time don't say anything to them because of the structural vulnerability that they feel. This means that when we're in a low power groups, our silence, albeit understandable, makes us complicit in the periodic dysfunctional aspects of power relations. 
Or differentiation or specialization among groups means that these groups need each other to piece together an accurate understanding of their shared circumstance. This is my second attack, excuse the military uh, language, on the belief that any of us in any group understands the whole picture. The different views of specialized groups. Modern organization is described by two things. We're talking about both of them today. One is hierarchy of authority, and the other is differentiation or specialization. Both of these processes create group understandings of the world. It is an inevitable, normal process. So we're not talking, the, this ethnocentric estrangement is not a pathology. It's what happens when you, when you specialize when you specialize by authority and when you specialize by function. Dissent can be an effort by one group to alert one or more groups to the loss of awareness of this fundamental complementarity. Five, dissent is almost always an intergroup event with the dissenter implicitly or explicitly representing a group or subgroup in his or her actions or words. This is the tricky part. We often mistake or misdiagnose Dissent for somebody's individual Jones. This is particularly tricky because if you don't see the group and you're not likely to want to see the group because it complicates your life if you're in a position of authority, you end up scapegoating the individual, seeing a collective phenomenon as isolated and existing in a person. The more visible the group behind the focal dissenter can be, the more likely the substance of the dissent will be taken seriously by the authority group. So the nurse who gathered other nurses, big deal. And, and, and thus, less likely that the focal dissenter will end up a scapegoat. The reason why dissent appears to be a consequence of individual action is, of course, because dissent is risky. If a vulnerable group can enlist one of its members to express collective distress about its relationship with a more powerful group, the rest of the group is protected against possible retaliation. In most cases, the dissenting group is trying to express a broadly shared protest while simultaneously isolating the protest in one person as a way of protecting the group. This is our complicity when we are the low power group. We're not always aware of it, but we'd much, we're really grateful when somebody expresses something. We're just glad it wasn't us. And when we get stopped in the hallway and someone in a position of authority says, you know, that Berg guy, what he said in that meeting, did you agree with him? We say, isolated, one-on-one -on -one with a powerful person, mm, it was a little extreme, thereby protecting ourselves and diluting the, the impact of the statement. Six, dissenters struggle with the paradoxical need to stay engaged with an authority with which it experiences a loss of connection. This is critical. I said it earlier on that dissent is not um, uh, about tactics. It's also not about destroying a relationship. Dissent, almost by definition, my definition, is a communication between two groups about what one group believes is happening to the relationship between them. It is not an act or set of acts intended to destroy that relationship. I wrote a little piece, which nobody wanted to publish, um, called Taking a Knee, which is about, um, about the protest about the national anthem and the symbolism of taking a knee. Anybody here ever play sports, team sports? Do you know what taking a knee means? Yeah, it means a coach comes around and says, take a knee, which means you're about to get some talking to or some information or some strategy or plans or whatever. Taking a knee in sports is a statement of respect for authority. So to use taking a knee as a protest, in my interpretation, is to testify to the fact that this is a connected statement to an authority group, not a disconnecting statement. Seven, the response by authority groups to dissent needs to involve opening the group's boundary if the group is to have a chance of taking in the communication about the dissenting group's perspective. It is quite natural for all groups, but especially groups with significant power and authority, to close down their boundaries in response to dissent from outside. They can be very tricky about that. They can create committees which appear to suggest that they are opening themselves to other groups while closing their boundaries at the same time. Especially if a group believes its views to be accurate, right, and well-informed, which most groups do, dissent from other groups can be experienced as potentially dangerous 
or corrupting since it follows logically that outside perspectives must be inaccurate, wrong, and poorly informed. Yet it's precisely this belief that the dissenting group is challenging. Finally, re revisiting dissent after the initial shock of protests involves a commitment to further data collection. Since dissent is a communication that the authority group has become ethnocentrically estranged from the lower power group, the consequences of that estrangement may not be readily apparent. Dissent conveys the message that while the authority group believes itself to be perfect in its understanding of the organizational world around it, the specific nature of its imperfect understanding remains to be discovered. There's nothing right about the dissenting group's view. It too has an encased um, view of the world, but it doesn't have the power to change lives and to change the institution based on that constrained understanding. So I'll conclude with another story. In 2010, Charles Jason Toll, an inmate at Riverbend Maximum Security Institution in Nashville, Tennessee, was forcibly taken out of his cell by correctional officers at the site. After repeatedly saying he couldn't breathe, Mr. Toll died in an outdoor courtyard. One of the officers, William Amanette, resigned a short time later because his efforts to alert the internal investigators to witnesses who would question the official version of events that night were not only ignored, but resulted in bad treatment towards Mr. Amanette. In his resignation letter, he wrote, I cannot work somewhere where asking questions or trying to do what's right is punished. Amen to that. Thank you. All right, uh, so what I'm going to introduce now is a case vignette to highlight an example of abuse of power in medicine. Uh, I'll invite some commentary from our speaker and then we'll open it up to discussion. So this information is meant to inform our conversation on power dynamics in medicine through use of a clinical vignette. This account of events was obtained from publicly available sources and in no way implicates specific involved parties. <clears throat> in summary, a patient at the Whiting Forensic Institute in Middletown CT admitted in 1995 after being acquitted by reason of insanity in the death of his elderly father in Greenwich was systematically kicked, jabbed, poked, and taunted by a succession of staff over a period of weeks. This was reportedly captured by video surveillance cameras that routinely operate in the lock wards of the institute. This patient had been on an observation status that required two staff members be present at all times. Letters reportedly written by the patient show the alleged abuse may have gone on for more than a decade. Publicly available reports describe treatment workers and some nurses arbitrarily going into the patient's room, kicking him, throwing food and liquids on him, or pulling the sheet over his head, and then simply walking out of the room only to return later to repeat the actions. The report describes the patient being flipped off of his bed onto the floor in the middle of the night and cowering in a darkened corner of the room. At one point, an incontinent diaper was placed on his head. The video again captures staff members taunting and bullying the patient and occasionally striking him. Nearly 40 staff members at Whiting have been subject to disciplinary action, including some with criminal charges. And again, this vignette is based on publicly available information. So I'd like to invite Dr. Berg to the stage and ask questions to sort of guide some commentary on this case. Would you like a water? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the first question, Dr. Berg. <laughs> What? You, you've read your disclaimer statement, now we ask me all the questions. <laughs> uh, what group dynamics commonly lead to positive, constructive use of power versus the negative, destructive use of power? So, so this is me um, channeling a politician. So that was a great question, I'm going to answer a slightly different one. <laughs> uh, a good politician doesn't say that as a preamble. Just, uh, um, 
I want to just um, go a step back, given the case that you read, and sort of reflect on why the question you asked is the right question, which is um, there's so many parts of that case which tell us that this is not about the individuals who are being disciplined, not exclusively about the individuals who are being disciplined. So that the question is, how did this organization get to the place where 40 people over a long period of time on recorded tapes um, uh, did this sort of abuse to a patient. That's not about the patient, and it's not about the ringleader, and it's not about the 40 people who are being brought up on charges. And I'm guessing not one of those people being brought up on charges are the people in charge of the institution. That is, it'll be somewhat below the people who are in charge of it. So the right question from an organizational point of view is, what have we been doing in this organization that has led to this kind of behavior? What have we, in positions of authority, I liken it to the discussions around gender at the, at the School of Medicine, which is the discussions that do not happen as frequently as I would like them to is, what have we, the people who have been in positions of authority at the university and the, and the medical school, done in the previous 10, 15, 20, 30 years that made it seem like it was okay to pay women less than men? Or what have we been doing such that uh, men who take a salary from us feel like it's okay to speak, act, and do certain things in certain ways? I would take the analogy of the, the, the whiting, which is I'm more interested in what we have been doing as an authority structure that seem to support, condone, ignore. And, and I say that as a, as a diagnostic question. I don't pretend to know what it is. Um, but I think that question needs to be asked first or alongside the punishment of the perpetrators if we're going to try to figure out what things contribute to bad behavior and conceivably what things contribute to the behavior we're hoping for in an institution like this. I'll say, I think that investigation, do, asking those questions is extremely difficult. You rarely see senior leadership in any organization say, what have I done? I, what we, meaning the top group. That's what I mean by, by uh, ethnocentric estrangement. If you were in those rooms, at the top of most organizations, when things like this happen, they're talking about what other people did. They're rarely talking about what they did. I, I brought a quote because you sent me these things yesterday. <laughs> so, um, oh, so it, it's a quote um, which I love um, from a woman named Allie Reisman. Anybody recognize that name? A uh, gymnast um, uh, who sued the United States Olympic Committee in the United States Gymnastics um, over the Larry Nassar case. Lest you think that this is an outlier, just remember the recent case of the ED doc at NYU, who was uh, abusing patients. Um, uh, so it happens all over the place. This is her quote when she sued them. It has become painfully clear that these organizations, the, the two ones she sued, but substitute your favorite organization, have no intention of properly addressing this problem. After all this time, they remain unwilling to conduct a full investigation. And without a solid understanding of how this happened, it is delusional to think su su significant changes can be implemented. I agree with her 100% that unless you understand how this came about, which usually involves all of us, not just the one or two people we're pointing at and remediating, it's delusional to think that organizational um, processes are going to change. Frank, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I'll ask one more question and then I'll turn it over to the audience. Okay. How can trainees and others with less power avoid feeling mute and complicit in morally distressing situations similar to some of the ones that you described? That's another really good question. So my simple answer is, and I'm going to speak both to the trainees and to the authority structure, the simple answer is um, you need a group. It, 
what we do, we, those of us in positions of authority, often unconsciously but purposefully is, we like to, all power, all up groups see the world in individual terms and all down groups see the world in group terms. So we in the up groups, when we're confronted with a little inkling of dissent, we go talk to an individual one on one and ask them, how's it going? What are the residents feeling? What are the trainees thinking? That's the worst condition under which to learn about your own ethnocentric estrangement. The best condition is to say, would you get a group together and fill up a piece of paper with what your concerns are? I don't want any names. Come back to me, show me the piece of paper. And then after I've read it, I'll come to the group and ask questions or I'll submit questions so that the group doesn't have to be in my face when they answer it. Me taking it, that's where it comes from. <clears throat> and taking names comes from being in the room and observing who's saying what and doing what. So my answer is we need to encourage low power groups to be groups, to convene themselves, to address the issues that they see and to communicate. It doesn't mean that I, as an authority, as a program director or an attending, I'm going to respond to everything that gets said, change. I may debate, I may discuss, I may talk about my perspective because the low power group has just as little understanding of the forces acting on me in the high power group as I do about the forces acting on them. But if I don't convene the group, the, the low power group in particular, now that's a tall order because as I said before, there's risk in coming together as a group. Who's the ringleader? Who brought these people together? Why are you segregating yourself? I mean, why do you feel you need that? There's something I've done. Oh, and I'm going to write you a letter in a couple of years. So this is a difficult thing to do. But my answer to your question is the only way to get that perspective expressed is since, the, since my view is this, this is an intergroup event, you have to convene the groups. Questions? If you do have a question, please speak loudly so the recording can capture it. The recording. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, I think this set, especially right now, is a really, really important theme, especially in medicine. So thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to dissent a little bit, and I hope I dissent well. <laughs> uh, I wanted to push back um, or, or hear your thoughts a little bit more on naturalizing universality, that like universality or universalizing is a natural or normal process for all groups. And the reason I want to push back against it is because I think it's a little bit dangerous. And rather than universalizing um, or, or universalizing universality or naturalizing universality, I think if you look at it historically, one thing that you can see is that actually some groups have and do universalize more than others, right? Some groups tend to universalize more, and, and one place to look that's sort of obvious is like white European colonization of the rest of the world. Was this effort, right, to expand universally from one place in the world to other places in the world through violence? And I think if you look at um, health practitioners who have actually pushed against universality, it's often from a place of um, anti-colonialism. So if you look at like Franz Fanon, for example, his uh, uh, sort of resistance or dissent was because he felt like he existed outside, as a black physician in anti-colonial Algeria, he existed outside of the universal. And so his dissent was, was which is kind of different than the dissent you're advocating, was actually a form of violence against the sort of colonial presence um, in this country. And so I wonder if you could speak to this idea that some groups actually have and continue to universalize more than others. Um, and I think that the reason that this is important is maybe for like organizational psychology is that certain markers in our society tend, of, of certain groups tend to be attached to universality more than others. For example, being white or being a man tends to attach to universality more than being, for example, like you know, Latino or black. And that the reason that is is for you know deeply historical reasons, right? And so, in, whenever we're talking about like interpersonal group dynamics like this, these are factors that are at play in the setting. So I was just wondering if you could talk about some some of 
some of the sort of power dynamics that have historically emerged between groups and how that relates to intergroup dynamics. Sounded like a statement. Thank you for yeah, it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, um, I'm not sure I need to say anything. My, you used the word universal slightly different than I did. Um, so let me comment on that. What I said, what I th think is natural for all groups is to become encased in their understanding of the world such that they think their understanding of the world is not just particular to them, but is universal in its understanding of the world. So for example, if you're a liberation theologist, you don't say, I could be wrong. Just like if you're a white supremacist, you don't say, I could be wrong. The difference is, the difference I would say is, that their groups have different amounts of power. And what they do with that belief that they see the world correctly and others don't is very different. And that's influenced by all kinds of things, including history and how history has come about. Um, now, uh, that might be controversial, having been inside all kinds of, it, it's not talked about much that actually low power groups, do I, do I think they have it to the same extent? If you push me, I would probably say, yeah, they just don't have anything, to, they don't have the wherewithal to do anything about that perspective, right? Is it possible that they, their boundaries are more open? It's possible, but the evidence of low power groups is that their boundaries close very quickly for reasons of protection and vulnerability. So I, I understand, and that's one of the benefits of being in a low power group, which is why most of us in the room as I talk are identifying with low power groups. Nobody wants to identify with a high power group because the comfort of a low power group is we've got a pretty tight boundary on us, we understand what's going on, and we get some support and comfort from being in, in that role. So if you push me in the extreme, if I'm making an extreme argument, which is, you were making a nuanced one having to do with what's the effect of history on, I'll use a different word, on the entitlement of different groups to do things to other groups, and is it the same for all groups? No, I don't, but that's the power. That's the intersection of power and what I would call a belief in one's universally correct understanding of the world. I happen to believe that most groups, all groups, believe they understand the world better than other groups, but powerful groups do something with it which is the history that, I, uh, how I experienced the history that you were talking about. And the low power groups don't have the wherewithal to do anything. I'm just a little skeptical about if you give low power groups a lot of power, and there's plenty of evidence of this historically, what they do with it. I think what they do with it oftentimes is they struggle to deal with the fact that now they think they understand what's really going on, but now they have the power to do something with it. Lots of groups in, in, throughout history have had that struggle. Now there's some groups that didn't, because they never <laughs> got in that position, and that's a longer history. You're calling on the questions because I'm not doing it. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, uh, for the wisdom and uh, for attacking such a, such a, uh, you know, a, a topic that affects every resident every day. Um, from in psychiatry, we're told that uh, we, uh, and in medicine in general, we're told that we, uh, we have a duty to our patients and to the uh, to protecting uh, their well-being, uh, even when the patient uh, is uh, uh, being inappropriate with us or being hurtful, um, and uh, and and not only that, but there is a uh, the sense that uh, psychiatry residents, everything is for our education. Um, that we should learn to um, put that those feelings into the met mental status exam and describe the patient or whoever we're interacting with, attending, who can, uh, you know, if an attending yells at you, then you know you should. Uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, when one attending yelled at me, I politely asked that he. Uh, didn't do that again, and he told me that I didn't take feedback well. Uh, I turned to other uh, other attendings, and they told me that I needed to develop that muscle. I turned to other residents, and they told me to be a yes man. So from all angles, I um, 
I, I was invalidated. And there was a clear, uh, a, you know, the, the, the patient had, you know, uh, abandoned me, right? The, the attending had abandoned me, and then the system had uh, abandoned me. And uh, going to my group was not necessarily a safe spot either because uh, they, when, when they noticed that my, uh, my own advocacy failed, then no one was willing to, uh, uh, to stand with me. So, uh, but I, at that same time, I did see my responsibility to grow that muscle. Uh, and I saw, I saw the educational potential of that interaction. So I got into this sort of like paralyzed state where I didn't know how to decide whether what had happened was actually right or wrong. And then, um, I don't know how, you know, I see this as, as an organizational problem. I see this as a cultural problem. Uh, I see this as a group problem. But whenever you are in the middle of it, that, you know, the paralyzed nature of your state, then doesn't, you know, it, it, it's part of the problem and part of what you went to residency for, or at least that's what you saw. Any advice on that? Um, so I'm impressed with the statements that are being made, which I appreciate. Um, there, you know, the question comes at the end, and the statement is about your experience. So you're enacting a little bit of what I'm talking about here, which is how do you talk about what your experience is and when it's hard to do that. So if you remember, I said this whole thing I've been talking about is not easy to do for exactly the reasons you just described. This is what I mean by the structural vulnerability and uh, of, uh, uh, this is, uh, and what happens when somebody tries to express dissent. Um, it's not easy. I don't have a simple explanation. It's, um, it, it's, a very, it's why it doesn't happen very often. It's why it's, when it does happen, it's crushed as quickly as it can most of the time, either explicitly or implicitly. It's really quite hard to do. Um, at your example of the group saying, gee, we're not gonna, you should just be a yes man, you should adapt, is unfortunately quite normal. Uh, normal as in norm, that is it happens a lot, not normative, but normal. Um, uh, that's why I'm actually, I, I was glad to be asked to come because mostly the audience I'm talking to are the people who are getting the dissent. Because when you ask the lowest power group, and this is about dissent, it's about low power groups saying, hey, something's wrong with our relationship. When you ask them to carry the water, it's the weakest link for all the reasons you just said. So you're hoping an attending says, when you say, hey, please, could you not speak to me that way? Says, I'm not even aware I'm doing that. It's so ingrained. You know, the American Medical Association has published two articles on pimping. You're not a physician. You see the word pimping roll off people's tongue like, oh, yeah, I got pimped in rounds the other day. It's like you can't believe the word has been appropriated for that. And then... The American, Journal of American Medical Service, the New England Journal publishes two articles about A, what its value is, and B, how to cope with it so you don't get abused. Ha ha. Okay? Like eat a muffin, stare at the ground, all kinds of things. Right? <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. You can look it up. I mean, you can look it up in the journal, right? So, I, I, I mean, it would take a longer time for me to say why I think that happens. That is, why abuse goes down the hierarchy in medicine. I think it's because no people, when the, I'll give you the two minutes. I, I think what happens in medicine, because it's such a hierarchical institution, and because it is life and death, and because it believes so strongly that you don't want to put, you know, you want to teach people, but you don't also want them to kill anybody, whatever that ethos is, right? That what happens is, when something happens to somebody in this position, they can't express how they feel up the hierarchy because it'll be labeled as unprofessional behavior or you got a problem. It can even be cause for remediation. I mean, even if you say it respectfully, it can be seen badly. But of course, let's say you had an emotional reaction. Like, damn, I can't believe you talk to me like that. You're a supervisor, you're somebody with authority in this instance, right? You said that, you'd be out. So communication up the hierarchy that's negative and critical in medicine is considered and labeled unprofessional behavior most of the time. If I can't direct to the authority structure 
the reactions I'm having to the way I'm being treated, that makes me feel powerless. I can't function as a physician if I feel powerless, so what do I do to make myself feel powerful? There are any dogs around to kick, but there could be a few trainees around on occasion. Now, nobody's going to say I do this. I'm trying to explain why it is such a feature of medical, such that it gets elevated to articles in, in journals about what, because there's no evidence for the psychologists in the room, is aversive conditioning a good way to teach an organism? So, <laughs> like evidence-based? Evidence-based. Yet we think that by abusing people, they're going to remember things. They're going to remember how to avoid abusing things, being abused, which is why they develop muffin eating strategies when they're on rounds, because <laughs> they're trying to avoid being called on. So, so I'm searching, I just give you my hypothesis, for why this happens, because I don't think it happens because it's in the interest of the trainees learning. I think it happens because we have a system in which hierarchical relationships are strained and tense because of the pressure everybody's on, and as a result, what's broken out is various forms of abuse, and because we can't uh, talk up the hierarchy where that abuse is coming from, we tend to enact it down the hierarchy. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about that, it's just a hypothesis. You want to go to the left? We have a right hand bias. <laughs> Everybody has a right hand bias. So we'll take Chris's question, then we'll go to the left hand side of the room. Um, I was struck by what you said about these things being inevitable in creating the psychology and the actual centric isolation of the And how that means that organizations characterized by hierarchy and, special and, and uh, specialization are inevitably going to decay. The groups are going to become isolated. The authority group is going to. So I'm going to come back to the inevitable So people who are thinking about organizations, including the leadership, shouldn't want that <laughs> if they have any kind of long-term view at all. You know, obviously, if they're only interested in their paycheck, that's not the time. But, but if they have any kind of long-term view and be building an organization with resilience, they shouldn't want that. And if they depend on having enlightened people in, in, in positions of power, that's fragile. That might work for five or 10 or 20 years, but it's fragile, because ultimately, the wrong person is going to get in that position. So, in terms of an organ of how you would put together, if you were designing an organization and you accept that it has to have hierarchy and specialization because that's necessary for the complex job that the organization needs to do, if we accept that, um, what would you build in structurally so that you're not too reliant on the goodwill of the people in authority in order for the entire organization to be resilient to try to act against these entropic effects of the ethnocentric isolation? Good question. It was uh, a question. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, it was a question. So, um, so I'll give you some examples of what's already been done to do that, and then I'll tell you what's less likely to be done, which I would build in. So, what's already been done, I think, in organizations that have adapted in, uh, um, to the to understanding that they don't understand the experiences of others, are organizations that not only tolerate but embrace groups that organize themselves to give that experience not only tolerate, but embrace. So for example, black managers associations, or Society for Women in Medicine, or these are groups that form, they didn't form because Berg said the only way to deal with this is to form a group, right? But they formed a group. To the extent that unions, you know, we used to say, back in the 70s when we were doing quality of work life, joint labor management quality of work life, you'd much rather run an organization with a functional union than without one. Because the union had the responsibility of finding out what its members thought, of managing the democratic nature of unions or not, as they, but that was on them. And the management could then say, hey, this is what we're thinking about. What's your reaction to this? What are the reactions, the diverse reactions within your group to what we're proposing here, as opposed to trying to decertify every union that came along, or wishing that these various groups were just a, would, would go away, would stop self-segregating, they're a pain in the ass, et cetera. So my view is not just tolerate, but embrace the, the groups that emerge in organizations that might have a different perspective and see if you can maintain a consistent conversation with them. 
consistent, meaningful conversation with them about what they see and what they experience. Now, many organizations have done that. Um, they haven't always done it with what I would consider to be the, um, uh, the full-hearted investment in it. Sometimes it's just a box check. But to the extent that it is engaged fully, or you know, with all the tension and conflict that sometimes comes with hearing things from different perspectives, and I'm saying in both directions, um, I think that is a structural um, um, intervention in organizations. The second one, which is much rare, is I think um, if I were running an organization, I would commit the senior leadership of that organization to regular self-scrutiny about whatever. In other words, whatever's in the environment that's troublesome, I would have the senior leadership say, what are we doing? Not how do we manage this thing that most senior leadership teams are pretty good at. But what are we doing that contributes to this thing which is bubbling up in our culture or our organization? And I would do that regularly. Uh, it could be facilitated by a consultant, I don't do this word, or by various pr processes um, that could collect data um, for that group to, to get some purchase on the question of what are we doing. Because everybody else knows it. Most of the time, a lot of people. So those are the two major things that I would do. Both allow, encourage, um, and uh, more than tolerate, but engage um, the different perspectives that are out there when they coalesce, and a commitment at the most senior levels to self-scrutiny. Now, if I could generate everything, I would ask all groups to commit to that self-scrutiny process, because I'm at least I try to be consistent in thinking that they're all going to have you know, a kind of encasement in their reality. But they don't all have the same power, so it's more important if I'm putting my chip down to put it on the senior group. Hi, Dr. Jordan. My name is Sophia. Thanks for speaking today. Um, I just want to also say, I have a statement and a question. I just want to say that Dr. Berg spoke at the AAMC conference about the cycle of, of abuse in medical um, training, and it was awesome. <laughs> and then my question, um, I, <laughs> my question has to do with, um, I guess I'm also be thinking about the, like the political climate right now. You know, like I feel like um, there's an uproof of like of federal leadership, and it almost feels like they're not trying to self scrutinize. Like I like that they're like, <laughs> <laughs> so their ears are closing to what the de like the lower groups are talking about. And I mean, and how do you get? How do you get like the upward to listen in nonviolent means? <laughs> 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 I don't know, I just, just let me comment. If you were watching, you remember, I don't know, some number of months ago, uh, President Obama said, maybe we got it wrong. Remember that quote was in the New York Times? So I would say all upgroups have a difficult time listening to what's going on. And uh, President Obama said, not that he's not personally interested in listening, but maybe as a group, there was another group in this country that we weren't hearing in the way in which I'm using hearing. Because, uh, you know, 60 million people voted for the person who's in the White House. So we are at significant risk if we think the problem is with the person in the White House we got a bigger problem of who's felt they're being heard and, and, and you know, this estrangement that we're talking about. I wish I had an answer. I mean, I've, ever since the election, I have been struggling with, this is my profession. The question is, how do we bring groups that have been um, rent this far apart? And right after the election, I'm sure all of you know this, people went from Veller's fellowships and things went home for Thanksgiving. And they were sitting across the table from family members. So the rift, the, the gulf, the question about how do we have a conversation about this was alive for lots of people. Um, and so I said to myself, well, you know, if somebody asked me, they're not going to ask me, I don't mean today, but what would I do? So I'd have to follow my theory. Uh, um, which is, and this is really hard to do, but what I do is I'd put together equal numbers of people from both sides, and I wouldn't start at the top. I'd probably start in my local community, and I'd say, can we get, you know, 20 people together, 10 of whom think what's happening in the administration is great, and 10 of whom don't? 
and could we find a way to start a conversation so that each group begins to understand the other's experience of our shared, in this case, country, nation. It's really hard to do. Who makes the first call? Whose behavior gets interpreted as a power move by the other group? The answer to that is both. This is a tough thing to do, to find an honest broker um, in a local thing. It says, how do we come together? But as, you, as, you, as you've seen about in, in uh, religious communities, if the leadership of religious communities can actually hold the space, you can get, for example, I speak for my own group, Jews and Muslims together to talk in a community. But somebody's got to hold that, um, that relationship together. Um, somebody has to be willing to say, I'm, I, I have a different perspective than that person, but I want to understand that perspective. And I think that, at the moment, we're struggling to find. We're struggling to find an, a critical mass of people on both sides who say, I don't think I understand what's going on for that side, and I'm committed to understanding it. Because we have such strong feelings about what we think, and may actually be true, about the other side. So it's a little hard to honestly say, I'm interested in what your perspective is. I'm interested in it not existing, the perspective, not the people. I'm interested in not existing. Um, and that makes it really hard. I, I don't have a good answer. I'm putting one foot in front of the other every day, trying to figure this out. Um, I hope, you know, we've talked about the Senate before, and the, the Senate kind of spoke a little about it in a positive way, but there are some groups that are just uh, amoral or very negative or want negative things to happen, and they also want a voice. How do you deal with the Senate and the Senate when it's particularly negative to the organization? So you'll notice in the various stories that none of this, um, that, that dissent as I describe it, is something that violates social established norms and that the people doing it are willing to live with the consequences of that violation. Um, Nonviolent dissent, you know, f has, a, has a relatively long history. Um, and I think uh, uh, this is going to get me in trouble, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, you know, there are certain uh, groups that are amoral. And those groups think that my group is amoral. So even the statement of uh, groups are amoral. I mean, let's just take, for example, um, the abortion debate. You can be 100% sure that both sides of that debate believe the other side is amoral. That's sort of OK in my scheme of things. What's not OK is shooting people, right? Because that's, that's something that presumably we both have agreed to in or now. If somebody says, I don't agree to the fundamental coexistence of it, then I think you have to enforce the law. That's why we have law. Now, what makes it a little tricky is, what if you get to the, this is totally topical, right? What if you get to the law? So, a version of the law, a version is, is the right to carry guns in various places, like churches and bars. Well, if that's the law, Enforcing the law means you let people carry guns into places, which, in my opinion, makes it more likely that somebody's going to make a mistake, quote unquote, or violate the generally accepted principles, which even the people who vote for carrying laws in churches would say you're not supposed to kill people. But they're making it more likely for somebody to get killed. You know, I, 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 I'm not in the business of telling people what to do with their, with their morality. I mean, I think, you know, if you feel something is amoral, I think you have to protest it. And I have them too. So I don't mean to sit here and say, well, everybody's the same. I have views about what's over the line. When something's over the line, I say enough, or I um, go to the ballot box, or I sit on a, on a green, or something like that. So I'm not saying morality is relative. I'm saying morality is a thing where we put a stake in the ground, and that's what we, we, don't, we stop at that point, right? What I am saying is people have different views of morality and what you do about a moral, moral violation in somebody else is also a tricky question. Just so I don't, you didn't ask this question and I don't know why I'm telling this story. Um, uh, I mean, I know why, but I had a, um, a very close African-American colleague for years. We were, in grad, we were in graduate school at the same time. 
He was a teaching assistant when I became a faculty. We collaborated, we wrote, we did all kinds of things. Dearly beloved, we talked about race all the time. Race, ethnicity, all the time. It, we, we did group dynamics, Tavi workshops together for anybody that remembers what Tavistock is. And what plagued me in our relationship and what plagued him was when his son was born, I said, I've already confessed I'm Jewish, right? What plagued me was if, quote unquote, this is a mental experiment at the time, this was 20 years ago, if they started coming for black people, would I hide his son, right, at the risk of my own family? And that's about as moral, violent sort of thing as you get. Because, of course, for me, it resonates with both there were people who didn't and there were lots of people who did when it was my people they were coming for. And the fact that I couldn't answer the question plagued me. So he said, when I first told him about my plague, and it was, it was, uh, it was occasioned by the birth of his, by, by, by the fact now there's a real child, this could really happen, right? There were children who were you know, who were protected from, you know, this evil. He said, oh, Berg, I know what you would do. No problem. I'm, I'm sure you would take Sebastian in. And a couple days later, he calls me up and he says, I get it. I'm not sure what I would do either. Now, if you look at the testimony of people who did that, they don't have a very sophisticated uh, explanation. They just say it was the way I was raised. It's just where their morality was. And I don't think we know what we would do in those situations. So you ask what I consider to be both an important and a very distressing sort of question for me, because I actually, when morality hits behavior, that's the part I don't think we can know until we're in the situation when we have to make that choice. And some of us have already been in that situation, have had to make that choice. Um, I, I don't know what to tell people to do. It's, uh, as I said, it plagued me then, it plagues me now. I, 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 I don't know what to say other than I hope I'm never faced with that situation. And, you know, it's on my mind a lot more than it was a decade ago. I inherited why am I telling you all this? I inherited, <laughs> I inherited two guns from an uncle who was in the Navy years ago. And when he died, he left me everything. He had nothing. Um, but it included two pistols. He was so I have these guns in my basement. And, uh, and I don't know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, my uh, graduate school roommate, office mate, um, was a former Marine in Vietnam. Um, then went to the... Ed, went to Harvard Business School and worked in the National Education Institute when it existed. Anyway, we got to be friends. I, I was curious about his life, and he was curious about mine. Anyway, I inherit these guns, and he takes me out. He says, look, you better learn how to use these. They're more dangerous if you don't know what to do than if you do. Okay. So I go out to a shooting range, and I fire this pistol. I have 50 rounds of ammunition and two guns in my basement. Never thought about it. They're separate, locked up. The last two or three years, I'm thinking about the guns in my basement. It crawls into my brain. Like, would I use them? Under what circumstances? Would they do me any good? Wait, I have a moral thing against violence and using guns? What am I doing with these guns? So this is the entropic, I believe, this is the entropic thing that's happening. Um, I use myself as a case. Um, because things are, in my view, things are starting to fall apart. There's no space to, where there's, there's no, it's very difficult to inquire about the experience of the other, and so we're, we're doing other things with our minds. At least I'm doing other things with my mind. It's very scary. So, so in, in your um, description of intergroup conflict, um, I can see a clear role for a mediator, even a consultant. Uh, and it's clearly, I can see how to think about the groups in, in play, but what I, ha I haven't heard, and I was curious to hear from you, is where the leaders emerge here. Even, even a mob has a leader, so I mean that in a neutral way. But what does this view of intergroup conflict and dissent say about the kinds of leadership prescriptions you might have or, or warnings? 
So actually, if you look um, at, uh, it's usually not written terribly much about or it comes out later. If you look at what happens when these intergroup um, estrangements are mediated towards some uh, mutual understanding and some movement, it's because the leadership of both groups found a way to get together. So in the 60s, in, 19, in the Bobby Seal trial here in New Haven, what comes out later is that at the president's house, was the head of the Black Panthers, the head of the police department, the, the night before the May Day demonstration, all of whom talked about what was going on and committed themselves to minimize the violence. Not to minimize the dissent, but to minimize the violence. That was not known at the time. Because, of course, to know that the Black Panther head was in with the president of Yale, conspiring to reduce the violence, would have gotten him tossed out of his leadership role. It turns out, this happens a lot. So I think actually there's less of a role for a consultant than there is for the role of um, leadership, formal or informal, to, as I said about the clergy, if you don't have you know, a, per, a Jewish person in a position of leadership and a Muslim person in a position of leadership that come together first to broker this conversation, it's not gonna happen. So I think the key is, for, and if you've read about Mandel, and Bo, if you've read about South Africa, the behind the scenes things that were happening between Mandela and, um, uh, I'm blocking on the name of the guy that was his counterpart at the time that he was in jail. They, they spent years talking about, you know, while one guy's in jail, the other guy comes and visits him in jail to talk about what's going on here. Why do you, you know, why? Are you? If that doesn't happen, I think it's very hard. Um, for there to be a conversation across the groups. So I think there's a crucial role for leadership. It's usually not advertised. If you see leadership advertising its connection to another group, it ain't happening. It's, it's, it's performance in one way or another. Now, you can have performance that deals with certain external environmental things. You can also have real conversation that's happening. If you don't have the real conversation across the leadership, um, I don't think this can happen. And usually that's the high power group inviting the low power. That's why, not an accident, that this meeting was happening at the Yale president's house. It could have happened somewhere else, but it was, it was initiated by the president of Yale um, to have these, these conversations on the eve of this. You know, there's National Guard here in New Haven on the streets. All the, all the streets were boarded up. Those of you who are here remember it. I mean, it was not, it was half my college um, class left town because their parents were afraid of the violence that was going to happen. So to make that bridge and that connection under those circumstances took a certain amount of courage. Right, that'll have to be our last question, but I want to thank Dr. Berg for coming uh, and providing his expertise to the crowd. Thank you. Thank you.